Demosthenes. Whoever it was, Sasius, that wrote the poem in honor of Alcibiades upon his winning the chariot race at the Olympian Games, whether it were Euripides, as is most commonly thought, or of some other person, he tells us that to a man's being happy, it is in the first place requisite he should be born in some famous city, but for him that would attain to true happiness, which for the most part is placed in the qualities and disposition of the mind, it is, in my opinion, of no other disadvantage to be of a mean, obscure country than to be born of a small or plain-looking woman. For it were ridiculous to think that he alas, a little part of Chaos, which in itself no great island, and Agina, which is an a, which an Athenian once said ought to be removed like a small eyesore from the port of Piraas, should breed good actors and poets, and yet should never be able to produce a just, temperate, wise, and high-minded man. Other arts, whose end it is to acquire riches or honor, are likely enough to wither and decay in poor, undistinguished towns. But virtue, like a strong and durable plant, may take root and thrive in any place where it can lay hold of an ingenious nature and a mind that is industrious. I, for my part, shall desire that, for any deficiency of mine in right judgment or action, I myself be, as in fairness, held accountable, and shall not attribute it to the obscurity of my birthplace. But if any man undertake to write a history that has to be collected from materials gathered by observation, and the reading of works not easy to be got in all places, nor written always in his own language, but many of them foreign and dispersed in other hands for him, Undoubtedly, it is in the first place, and above all things, most necessary to reside in some city of good note, addicted to liberal arts, and populous, where he may have plenty of all sorts of books, and upon inquiry may hear and inform himself of such particulars as, having escaped the pens of writers, are more faithfully preserved in the memories of men lest his work be deficient in many things, even those which it can least dispense with. But for me, I live in a little town where I am willing to continue, lest it should grow less, and having had no leisure, while I was in Rome and other parts of Italy, to exercise myself in the Roman language on account of public business, and of those who came to be instructed by me in philosophy, it was very late, and in the decline of my age, before I applied myself to the reading of Latin authors, upon which that which happened to me may seem strange, though it may be true, for it was not so much by the knowledge of words that I came to the understanding of things, as by my experience of things, I was enabled to follow the meaning of words, but to appreciate the graceful and ready pronunciation of the Roman tongue, to understand the various figures, and connection of words, and such other ornaments in which the beauty of speaking consists, is, I doubt not, an admirable and delightful accomplishment, but it requires a degree, a practice, and study which is not easy, and will better suit those who have more leisure, and time enough yet before them for the occupation. And so, in this fifth book of my parallel lives, in giving an account of Demosthenes and Cicero, a comparison of their natural dispositions and their characters will be formed upon their actions and their lives as statesmen, and I shall not pretend to criticize their orations, one against the other, to show which of the two was the more charming or the more powerful speaker. Well, depends on the circumstances, what's going on with all that, right? For there, as Eon says, 
we are but like a fish upon dry land, a proverb which Cachilius perhaps forgot when he employed his always adventurous talents in so ambitious an attempt as a comparison of Demosthenes and Cicero, and possibly if it were a thing obvious and easy for every man to know himself. The precept had not passed for an oracle. The divine power seems originally to have designed Demosthenes and Cicero upon the same plan, giving them many similarities in their natural characters, as their passion for distinction and their love of liberty in civil life, and their want of courage in dangers in war, and at the same time also have added many accidental resemblances. I think there can hardly be found two other orators who from small and obscure beginnings became so great and mighty, who have contested with kings and tyrants, both lost their daughters, were driven out of their country, and returned with honor, who, flying from thence again, were both seized upon by their enemies, and at last ended their lives with the liberty of their countrymen, so that if we were to suppose that there had been a trial of skill between nature and fortune, as there is sometimes between artists, it would be hard to judge whether that succeeded best in making them alike in their dispositions and manners. Are this in the coincidences of their lives? We will speak of the eldest first. Demosthenes, the father of Demosthenes, was a citizen of good rank and quality, as the pompous informs us, surnamed the sword maker, because he had a large workhouse and kept us and kept servants skillful in that art at work. But of that which Askinus, the orator, said of his mother, that she was descended of one Galan, who fled his country upon an accusation of treason and of a barbarous woman. I can affirm nothing, whether he spoke true or slandered and maligned her. This is certain that Demosthenes, being as yet but seven years old, was left by his father in affluent circumstances, the whole value of his estate being little short of fifteen talents, and that he was wronged by his guardians, part of his fortune being embezzled by them, and the rest neglected, insomuch that even his teachers were defrauded of their salaries. This was the reason that he did not obtain the liberal education that he should have had, besides that, on account of weakness and delicate health, his mother would not let him exert himself, and his teachers forbore to urge him. He was meager and sickly from the first, and hence from uh, hence had his nickname of Vitalis given him, it is said, by the boy's in derision of his appearance, Vitalis being, as some tell us, a certain enervated flute player, in ridicule of whom Athenus wrote a play. Others speak of Vitalis, the writer of wanton verses and drinking songs, and it would seem that some part of the body, not decent to be named, was at that time called Vitalis by the Athenians. Well, I think we know which part that is. Uh, but the name of Argus, which they also say was the nickname of Demosthenes, was given him for his behavior as being savage and spiteful. Argus being one of the poetical words for a snake, or for his disagreeable way of speaking. Argus being the name of a poet who composed very harshly and disagreeably, so much as Plato says for such matters. Now, it's very, very important that uh, when, you, when you're in charge, um, that the poor, the slaves, and by slaves, I mean prisoners too, let's be honest, um, that education goes forward to those.